ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Plymouth University, welcome to the Royal and Dominsky Building, and welcome to this evening's Cork Talk. I'm sorry for the slight delay, it is of a technical nature, but it is being sorted out at this very moment as I speak. Some of the older members of the audience will remember a series of books written by Hugh Lofting about a certain Dr. Doolittle. And um, I see some people nodding. And if you haven't read the books, you may have seen the film. In fact, there have been several films about Dr. Doolittle. And the central thesis about Dr. Doolittle's books is that animals can speak. And all we need to do is to learn their language. And if, as Dr. Doolittle does, you learn their language, you can then talk to the animals. There's a little song about talk to the animals. Um, You've got a couple of minutes. I've got a couple of minutes. <laughs> Well, this evening we have two eminent speakers. On your left you have Dr. Lawrence Wright, and on your right you have Dr. Sarah Collins. And Lawrence will be arguing that the thesis of Dr. Doolittle is basically a little far-fetched. And that animals really don't have a language in the sense that we have a language, and there's a clear dividing line between animals on one hand and humans on the other. And Sarah will be taking the view that actually this dividing line is nowhere near as firm as we might imagine, and that there's much more of a gradation between the language of animals and that of humans. And this is not just an issue of language, it's also an issue of how we treat animals. Because as a general rule, we don't eat other people. Uh, you don't see human steaks in the butchers, but you do see steaks of cows and pigs and so on. And um, one indication is that there's some sort of difference between humans, and that's why, you know, we don't eat humans, they speak, for example, they might object to being eaten. Whereas cows are very happy to eat the grass and go to the butcher and be slaughtered. So there's a sort of implication here that it's not just about language, but it's also about the way we treat animals. Well, some of you may already have views, one way or the other. Whether you're going to vote for Lawrence, who is of the carnivorous camp, and believes that there is this clear dividing line between us and animals, and Sarah on the other side, I won't say necessarily she's on the vegetarian camp, but she certainly has a much more sympathetic view towards animal values than, uh, than uh, Lawrence does. So I'd like to ask you to vote at the end, but as we have just a few minutes uh, at the moment, I'd like you to vote now. So who's in favour of a firm dividing line between animals and humans with regard to language? Raise your hands now. <laughs> Lawrence is raising his hands to show. And those of you who think that there is this gradation, raise your hands now. Okay, so at the moment we have a majority in favour of Sarah, and we're going to see whether there is in fact a shift one way or the other. Now, are we ready with our... I think we're ready to <coughs> So, let me start then by inviting Lawrence to make his case. Lawrence, over to you. Thank you very much, Michael. I've never thought of it in terms of um, well, some vegetarianism mind? before. I don't know, I've got yeah, something, I've got this man ready. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right, I've got my hands full now, okay. Right, so, can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> Jolly good. Right, so, um, where was I? Yes, when last I counted, there were something like eight or nine million different um, species of animals on the planet, and many of them have communication systems of one type or another. Very often, the key messages are basically, um, uh, do you want to fight, or um, I'm sexually available? Um, and which are obviously critical things for survival, and the sort of thing you see down the average uh, city centre on a Friday night as well. But the human language can do much more than that, of course. And um, I, I don't really have time to go into the differences in 20 minutes between uh, human language and animal communication systems in, in detail. So I'm going to focus on two uh, familiar, but uh, in some way mysterious creatures, um, which are the, uh, the chimpanzee and um, the human infant. And uh, I'm going to contrast these in terms of their uh, readiness uh, for speech, the ability to produce speech, and their use of language, uh, the use of communication for um, maintaining social bonds. And um, 
uh, well, let's uh, crack on with that um, by uh, just having a look at um, the sort of thing that uh, human infants can do and chimpanzees fail to do. Um, we know, of course, that chimpanzees are uh, famously our closest living relative, and we're also the closest living relative of chimpanzees. Our evolutionary pathways diverged um, about six million years ago, um, and of course we share 98.8% uh, of our DNA, uh, the highest estimate of our DNA, um, with uh, chimpanzees. But uh, whilst chimpanzees, as Sarah will talk uh, about to some extent, um, uh, really can't be taught to speak, even when raised with human infants, human infants uh, learn language like falling off a log. They can learn two, three, four languages simultaneously. It's incredibly easy. They're sort of hardwired, preset to learn language. So what's the difference? What's going on there? So I'm going to start with a little video. Probably come not lean down here to make that work. Oh, great. Can we have some sound, please? Sound, anyone? <laughs> Technical people? <coughs> Doing it now, right? Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Can we do that again? <coughs> That would be much more eloquent than me, to be honest. But um, so she's doing a remarkable thing. Actually. She's producing this huge range of different sounds. She's actually learning English. She's about eight months old, and um, she's rehearsing all these different vowels and consonants that she'll need to communicate with in the next um, uh, two or three years. Um, in English, we have um, about uh, we have twenty-four consonants. And according to dialects, we have about 20 vowels. We can combine these into um, hundreds, thousands of, um, uh, of different syllables. And of course, these syllables make up many, many words. So uh, we probably all share a common vocabulary of something like 40,000 words. And then we all have our own sort of specialized vocabularies, our own slang, depending on where we were brought up, um, our own vocabulary for, how we, uh, for what we do at work. Um, and, and this sort of thing. So we have our own specialised vocabularies as well. But maybe 40,000 words we could all sort of identify and agree on the meaning of. And then most importantly, we can combine these words into an infinite number of sentences. So we could all take 20, 10 seconds to think of a sentence that's probably never been said ever before in the history of the world. And not only that, um, this sentence would be understandable by the rest of us. So as uh, Noam Chomsky famously said, language has this infinite, rule-governed creativity. And that's one of the distinctive features of human language. But to get to that, we have to master the sounds, as this child is doing. And even before the sounds, we have to get on top of breathing. So I, I'm going to start by thinking about the breath. And we can just, I'll just play a little clip of this video again, and just have a look at the breathing. see what she's doing when uh, she's talking there is taking a big breath in and then expelling this air gradually um, and making many many different syllable, so uh, syllable sounds um, as she's going on the one breath and that's completely different from how we normally um, we normally breathe so typically our pattern of um, inspiration and expiration we, uh, we take about equal time on breathing in and breathing out but when we speak, we take a big breath in, and then we use our um, intercostal muscles, so the muscles um, in the, the, in our, around our ribs, to slowly control the out-breath. So we've got enough air to, 
produce all of the sounds that we're making. Okay. So, um, and the suggestion is that this um, happened over evolutionary time, this famous sort of diagram with the center of man, if you like. Um, when we, and it particularly happened when we went from being um, a quadrupedal, so essentially walking on all fours, to walking on our hind legs. Once we walk on our hind legs, then we're not using um, our, our intercostal muscles to carry so much of our weight. So it's freeing them up to do this important job of controlling our breathing when we speak. And that's completely different from um, how a chimpanzee vocalizes. So chimpanzee, sorry, um, can you hear me at the back anyway? Sorry, yeah. Okay, um, so chimpanzees um, vo do vocalize, they have a limited range of vocalizations, but they breathe in a completely different fashion. Anyway, apparently the chimpanzees enjoy that. Um, it's, uh, that's uh, chimpanzee laughter. And they do laugh, and they laugh in various predictable circumstances, like being tickled, as the chimpanzee was there. But chimpanzee laughter follows this sort of breathing pattern, so it's just like they breathe normally. Each, each individual laugh sound comes out on a separate breath, whereas when we laugh, we laugh like we talk. We have a big in breath and we go ha 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 um, <laughs> on the sarcastic laughter in on one breath. Okay, so that's our, our, our breathing. Um, now, obviously, once the air comes out of the lungs, then it has to go somewhere else. And what it does is it goes through the larynx. And so this is another big anatomical difference between humans and other primates, such as chimpanzees. So in the, uh, the, ch the uh, chimpanzee here, and in the orangutan, the larynx is very high in the throat. It's incident almost on the back of the nose. And this means that the air goes straight um, out the back of the nose and into, um, into the larynx and down into the lungs. Whereas in the human adult, the, the larynx is much lower in the throat. So the larynx, you know what I'm talking about here, the voice box, and the apple, you can all feel it in your throat, it vibrates and moves up and down when we talk. And um, the air passes through the larynx on its way um, into and out of the lungs. But uh, the, this lowered larynx uh, down the back of the throat in humans um, has important uh, consequences for our ability to produce speech. Not only that, though, it's often been cited as a classic example of unintelligent design. If you're going to build a person, you wouldn't put the larynx down there. Because essentially, you've got two pathways. Uh, important pathways in your in your head down into your, the rest of your body. You've got the air going in through your nose and down into your lungs, and you've got your food coming in through the mouth and down into the uh, uh, down into your stomach via right, the esophagus. And in humans with the lowered larynx, these pathways cross over, and that means that food, well, air can end up in your uh, in your stomach, and the worst thing that can happen there is maybe you might burp um, or. But food can also end up in your lungs, and of course that can be very serious and potentially fatal. So having this larynx in this position is actually a serious health hazard and suggests that there may ought to be some important uh, positive benefits in having the lowered larynx. It's worth noting that uh, human infants are like chimpanzees in this regard. Um, up until about the age of three months, their larynx is high in the throat, incident on the back of the nose, and this means that human infants can feed and breathe at the same time, because it's very important for them to do both, so they so can feed quite happily without having to pull the breath until the larynx descends, and by about three months, they, they can't do both things together. Now, what advantage, then, does the, uh, the lower larynx have, given that it uh, potentially could kill us? So I've got a little video here, a little bit of a musical interlude.
bit of um, uh, footage from a magnetic resonance imaging machine there. I've no idea how they do that, but it's all very impressive. I think the first thing to note about that, as a phonetician, is it's fairly clear that the brain is not involved in speech, uh, because that's just sitting there, sort of doing nothing, like a blob of jelly, and you know, the action is happening down here. Um, but what we can see from this film is the importance of the lowered larynx for speech production. So the larynx is right down here, and uh, what that creates is essentially two different areas above the larynx in the vocal tract. We've got um, the mouth, basically the oral cavity, above the tongue, and then we've got the pharyngeal cavity, the pharynx, cavity or pharynx, uh, behind the tongue. And these, uh, by, by moving your jaw and your tongue, you can vary the size um, of each of these cavities separately. And it's effectively like selecting two different organ pipes of uh, different sizes and sticking them together. And what that allows you to do is create this huge big range of resonances, different resonant frequencies, that allow us to make all the, the distinctive sounds of our languages. So vowel, in particular vowels, but also consonants. And we can see that here, so we've got, here the tongue is sort of moving back to the, the, the back of the mouth um, to produce the sound R. Ah. So if you go to the dentist, they want to look in the back of your mouth, they ask you to say R, ah, because the tongue is low uh, there. And here we've got the tongue high in the front of the mouth, producing the sound E. Do that for yourself at home later if you like. And when you do that, what you can see, what you see is that you have this gigantic big cavity in the back. The, the pharyngeal cavity is huge there, creating a nice big distinctive resonance. So there's no way we would mistake an R for an E, for example. So um, that's uh, speech sounds, and um, it's clear that we uh, that the lowering of the larynx and this uh, ability to control our breathing was happening over this evolutionary time of six million years since we descended um, from our last common ancestor with chimpanzees. In fact though, uh, it's, it was uh, only uh, three, it was, uh, three million years ago that we actually were already walking upright and therefore probably getting this, this machinery into line, this vocal machinery. So famously, um, this uh, Lucy, this fossil Lucy, was found in Ethiopia and was dated back to 3.2 million years ago. Only quite small, um, three foot seven, um, but clearly walking upright. So we're walking upright a long, long time ago. The thing to note on this graph, so this is a uh, time in a non-linear scale. Um, what we've got here is basically brain volume. So Lucy, although walking upright, still had a brain. Um, the size of the chimpanzee. So uh, the brain presumably had not got any larger from our, from our last common ancestor then. Which raises the question, well, okay, so we had all this vocal apparatus to uh, enable us to speak, but were we actually intelligent enough to say anything very interesting? Uh, did we have any conversation three million years ago? Um, of course, over time since then, our brains were gradually getting bigger, particularly in the last million years. And, well, I think the question, the, the, the answer to that is we may not have been talking about anything in particular, but we'll, what we're probably doing is using our voice for, for, for making friends. Um, so, um, in the last, uh, I'll come to that in a second, but in the last, uh, say, two million years, it's, it's fairly clear that we were not moving forward in terms of intelligence very, very rapidly. So we've got this sort of stone age began about two and a half million years ago. Uh, and essentially, the, the initial stone tools were very, very simple, just pebbles that we chipped against a bigger rock to create a sharp edge. And then we, uh, we come on to the sort of middle stone age with these hand axes, which were around for about a million and a half years, and more sophisticated hand axes, um, so look like this sort of pointy diamond sort of shape. Um, but again, the technology didn't change for a long, long time. Our, our forebearers were very, very conservative with their technology, which suggests um, a sort of lack of cultural inventiveness. And then finally, um, uh, we had Homo sapiens about uh, 200,000 years ago, but only in the past 80,000 uh, years did we see this cultural explosion, suddenly this 
big range of human artifacts suggesting human activity, human cultural activity. So we've got shell beads, for instance, that have been drilled to wear on a string. We've got fine bone tools. We've got use of color for body adornment. All sorts of signs of human culture which suggest communication uh, within, uh, within groups and also, most importantly, between generations. So building on the knowledge of uh, preceding generations to sort of further develop our culture. Before that, though, um, we were equipped for speech, so what were we talk about? As I say, most likely, we were using speech for socialising. So, um, this is uh, uh, essentially what this diagram shows, is the size of the neocortex, so that's the crinkly part of the brain, relative to the rest of the brain, and this is the average group size in uh, um, various uh, monkeys, so in various primates, so monkeys, and apes, uh, so gorillas and chimpanzees. And what you can see, essentially, is that the bigger your average social group size, so the, the units that you live in, uh, your, your tribal group, the bigger that tribal group, the larger is your neocortex. And, uh, well, of course, humans have a very, very big neocortex, and so extrapolating from that, here's humans, the size of their cortex, uh, we get to the expected group size of the humans of uh, this famous number, some of you may have heard of, of 150. That's meant to be the number of uh, different relationships that we can maintain um, in our, um, at any one time in a sort of effective fashion without our brains exploding. So 150, that's meant to be the ideal number for humans. How do we maintain relations within those groups? Well, chimpanzees do it. Uh, famously by grooming. So chimpanzees spend a lot of time, about 20% of their time, stroking each other's fur, picking off the nits and uh, twigs and leaves, and uh, keeping each other clean. And this confers great benefits to chimpanzees. They actually get a release of hormones, uh, pleasurable hormones, when they do it. And when, they, when they're grooming with other people, grooming with other chimpanzees, establishes these strong bonds that indicate that they're socialising, uh, that these are the chimpanzees that they're going to uh, co potentially cooperate with rather than, rather than rivals. So it's extremely important for maintaining the group size. And the simple hypothesis, which I think has a lot of uh, power in it, is that human speech is fulfilling the same role for us. We, given that all the people that we come into into contact with in our average uh, social groups of 150, we can't possibly spend, um, can't possibly maintain our social relations by grooming. We would just take, we would spend all our time stroking each other's fur, and we never get anything else done. Pleasant though it may be. Um, so the idea is that rather than grooming, we use uh, vocal markers to indicate affiliation. So things like accents, just talking to people indicates affiliation. In particular, the way we talk the distinctive way that we talk, and similarly to our social group, and distinct from other social groups. So um, I'm just I'm going to wrap up. I've just got a couple of things to say about babies and um, uh, and how they they show evidence of this social imperative long before they're actually learning uh, to talk, to produce words, to say anything sort of that we regard as sort of interesting um, linguistically. So newborn babies actually uh, prefer the sound of their mother's voice to another, uh, to another woman's voice. And you can test this by training babies to suck more quickly or more slowly on a dummy to get their mother's voice or another voice, and they definitely prefer their mother's voice. So they hear their mother's voice in the womb very clearly, and they prefer that voice. And um, clearly they don't know what their mother's saying, but they like the sound of it. And it's probably something about the rhythm, melody of the voice in particular. And not only that, newborn infants prefer a native language to another language. Um, and finally, I'd like to draw in some uh, research that's been carried out in Plymouth uh, in, the, in the baby lab here. And this is the baby lab team and uh, various people doing research on both language development and other aspects of uh, development from the age of five months up to, uh, up to school age. 
And uh, it's easy to spot the odd one out here. It's this guy at the back of me, because I've got no idea how to do research on infants, but my colleagues are good enough to uh, collaborate with me. I'm going to talk about one bit of research that was done before I turned up in Plymouth, which is looking at um, local accents and the effect of local accents on children's preference for words. So um, I don't know how many of you are native Plymouthians, but you'll certainly know that there is a distinctive local accent, as there is anywhere, and one of the key features of this local accent is the fact that we pronounce uh, in, in Devonian um, the, uh, the R at the end of syllables. So I'll just play these examples here. Bear. 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 Tiger. <laughs> tiger. Okay, so the tiger one is quite good. Tiger. Okay, so, so that's a, a distinctive mark of Devonian uh, uh, and, and Polish as well, producing this, this R sound. And this experiment, which is a very simple experiment, but really nice um, experiment with these um, uh, 20 month old infants. They showed pictures of, of objects like bears and tigers, and um, they played the, uh, the children various uh, versions of this, uh, of this word, either with the R or without the R. And the most interesting uh, manipulation here was to take infants, 20-month-old uh, infants, who were growing up in Plymouth, but their parents did not speak a Plymouthian accent, so their parents spoke uh, an accent in which they didn't have this, uh, this R sound at the end of syllables. And the question was, which version of these words would these children prefer? And really, counterintuitively and highly surprisingly, um, these children preferred the version, uh, the, the Plymouthian version. So even though their parents were speaking of uh, this accent without the R, they preferred to hear the Plymouthian version. Um, this, there are lots of things you can say about this, but I think it does speak to the fundamental importance of language as a social device. So you've got um, infants, by 20 months old, they're pretty much confident that their parents are going to look after them however they sound and whatever they say, um, but they're interacting by this age with people in the outside world, and the importance of um, being able to be understood by people in the outside world and being able to recognise these people as sort of fellows, as affiliates, as people you potentially could cooperate with, means that they're preferring the version of this of these words that relates to the local environment rather to what their parents do. So that's the end of my pitch um, for the distinctiveness of human language. Um, in particular, thinking about this power of uh, language to allow us to have these big social groups and maintain these social bonds, much, uh, much larger groups than uh, the primates do. And I'll finally wrap up with a clear demonstration of the fact that language is incredibly powerful as a social tool, even when you're not really saying it. going to present the contrary argument that there is not quite such a distinction between animals <laughs> and humans. Sarah, over to you. Okay. Um, hang on a minute. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay.
Right. I will be doing a bit of a yo-yo because I've got lots of sounds and videos. So I'm going to be talking about animal communication and I think I've got a harder job in a way because there's quite a lot of species of animal. So I can't do everything um, in terms of animal communication but hopefully give you a flavour of what animals can do and how people have tried to study what might be similar to language in animals. So one of the main um, initial methods for looking at how animals communicate, thinking about whether they have similar abilities to us, has actually been us trying to teach animals to communicate with us. And most of that work has been done on primate, uh, on great apes in fact. So as you will have heard in Lawrence's talk, you can't actually get them to speak. If you rear a chimpanzee baby or little infant with humans, it won't learn to speak. It doesn't have the vocal apparatus. So most of the studies on apes and ape language have been either teaching them something like um, American Sign Language, in the case of um, this gorilla here, or giving them some kinds of extremely complicated boards full of signs and symbols that they can press to indicate different things. So they can um, communicate with us by using the correct symbols and we communicate back with them by again either using those symbols or sometimes speaking to them. And all of those experiments took up many, many years. It requires somebody to spend an awful lot of time with um, the apes that they're teaching to get them to be able to do this and constantly trying to push them on the right track to pick the right symbols. And they get a reasonable vocabulary, maybe 200 words or so. They might combine them in a sentence, but that will only be perhaps three or four words. And it's nearly always about something like, give me banana, um, or want to play, or um, hug me. So it's mostly about actions, demands, objects. They're not particularly um, complex in any of their sentences, and they quite quickly run out of things to say. So, although that research has been very interesting, and you probably ended up with more that you could communicate with them, it wasn't really, in the long run, um, so suitable. And recently, there have been other animals being taught to communicate with symbols, I particularly like this one. If you actually, if you look online for sort of dog communication board, I mean, this has got some of the symbols on, but it's even got poopy, pee pee, um, <laughs> food, and so on. And the, the idea is the dog can go and press its nose against one of these symbols and ask for something. And you can touch the symbol, and you can tell the dog um, something about what you're thinking. Um, sea lions have also been taught to use symbols, although in a more simple way. And this is actually from a more of a cognitive experiment where they have to try and guess which one to press. But they have been taught to communicate using those symbols. And the other class that's been taught is the bottlenose dolphin, and again, they're pressing in this case on, um, I think it's an iPad actually, a waterproof iPad, and again, they can communicate by pressing symbols, and they can be shown symbols. So all of these methods are about us trying to get them to tell us what they want by using something artificial. Dolphins have actually managed, I think, the best and they can actually understand and respond with relatively complex <coughs> sentences, so they can use compound sentences. But as any of you will know, I don't know how many of you here have a pet, but many of you have dogs. And I expect that most of you have got quite a good communicative, communicative relationship with your dog. I don't mean that they do what you want, because I have a dog too, never does what I want, but I know what the dog wants. <laughs> I know exactly what the dog wants, and the dog knows exactly what I'm about to get up to, particularly if it involves going for a walk, um, about to give it food. And in all of these cases, people are spending a long time with animals, and they're actually slowly picking up on each other's signals, just as your dog does. Your dog learns exactly what you do when you're going for a walk, which pair of shoes do you wear, all those kinds of things. So it's very difficult to know in this case whether they're simply picking up things that predict the future, things that will get them what they want, or are they actually understanding anything? The only one that has ever managed to give you complex communication is Alex the parrot. He sadly died, age 31, a few years ago, 
But one thing about parrots is, of course, that they can actually copy human speech. So play just a short clip, actually. I won't take up too much time. Yes. What matter? Whoa, that's right. You're a good one. Parrots can answer different questions about the same object. How many corners? What shape? What shape? Four. Corner. Four corner. Good boy. Alex hasn't just learned to say a certain coming? word when he sees a particular How object. Many? He's How paying many? attention to the questions. How many? Two. That's right. You're a good boy. No, no, you can't go back again. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually like that better. The parents want to go back. I want to go back. And a bit later in the clip, he asks for um, a shower and gets sprayed with water. So Alex managed to understand different questions where the words were put together in different ways. So he couldn't really be learning if somebody's waving two keys at me. What exactly should I say? So the questions were different. It might be which one is bigger. Uh, which one is smaller, and so on. So Alex managed to communicate very well. However, of all the parrots that Irene Pepperberg was teaching, he was by far the best. So it seems as if it's not something that works all the time. As far as I'm concerned, the way to understand what might be going on in animal communication, how smart they are, how close it is to language, is actually to try and tap into what animals are doing when they communicate with each other. And I think that way you can learn much more about what might be the precursor, if you like, to what humans can do. Um, teaching animals to communicate with us might help us manage them, might help us understand the things they like to do, but it might not tell us that much about where our language came from. So the rest of the talk is going to be about what animals do when they're talking to each other. I'll talk a bit more about this in a second, but a lot of the studies that relate to where language might have come from are about referential signals. And these are signals that animals produce that refer to something in the environment. And the most common example are different sounds for different predators. So an individual will give an alarm call that's different for an aerial versus a terrestrial predator. And the idea is that they're symbols of something in the external world, and that might be one of those kind of evolutionary origins of where our language came from. And most of the other research is more just about how complex does animal communication get. And that kind of research tends to look at what happens when you've got very complex social groups, how do they manage their social relationships, how does the structure work. There's a lot of stuff, as Lawrence mentioned, on mating behaviour. How do you show off how amazing you'd be as a mate or how you try and stop somebody from trying to beat you up? And also I'm going to talk a little bit about vocal learning. I'll come on to later. So first of all, I'm just going to talk about um, mammal referential calls. I mean again, a lot of studies in primates, because people really think we must look at primates, that helps understand people. And there's a number of species where they give different alarm calls for different predators and also different calls for different food types. I don't know if you can play the top sound. Can you hear it? I'll just turn it up. Some of the later ones are really loud. So. Can you hear that? Anyway, if you hear that, there's an eagle about. The next one, if you play the bottom one. <coughs> so if you hear that one, you should be really scared, because that means a leopard's about. So Diana monkeys, which is the monkey in the picture, make these different alarm calls for different predators. And there's a very good reason for doing so. If you are worried about an eagle, what you need to do is get to the middle of the tree, cling to the trunk, because the eagle can't get you there. If a leopard's around, you need to get to the edges of the branches, on the thin branches, because the leopard can't climb up the tree and get to you. And obviously, you don't want to be doing the wrong thing. If you go on the branches at the edges, the eagle will get you. 
Interestingly, this bird species, a hornbill, that listens out for these alarm calls and also does the same behaviours. It has learned that when the monkey does this, um, this kind of predator's around. So you've got interspecies communication in that case. So there's a wide range of studies looking at these alarm calls and how they relate to what's going on and how individuals learn the correct response. And it probably seems pretty amazing. It might seem a bit less amazing when you find out that chickens can do it too. So chickens also give different calls for whether um, a predator is in the air or on the ground. And again, if you could try the top sound, it works. So that means there's a hawk about or a falcon. And the bottom sound? That's one. Yeah, that one. That might mean there's a dog or a fox around. So chickens also show different behaviours depending on which predator it is. So it seems these kind of calls are useful because they direct you, they direct the listener as to the appropriate behaviour. Ravens have also been quite well studied. They give a lot of different call types. This is just some of the different call types. And these first two are used to indicate different kinds of food and they can indicate something of how much of that food there is. So there's quite a lot of information that they can pass on. And something that's common about the species I've talked about so far is they all live in social groups that are very stable, often composed of relatives or mates and their offspring. And you seem to get this kind of information transfer evolving relatively frequently when you've got systems where you've got long-term social groups and you might want to help your um, social mates avoid getting eaten. One of the other potential precursors that has been studied is the fact that you sometimes get cooperative communication in pairs of animals. So gibbons show this amazing duetting behaviour and the male is black and the female white, so white cheek gibbons um, and if you start the video, you'll see that they're singing, or singing, screeching, um, in coordinated manner. Oops. Okay. Or not. about humans is the fact that we actually do show incredible vocal learning. So I think although these are really interesting and I love the fact that they can happen, they don't tell us that much about where language might have come from because they seem to be things that have evolved uh, for other reasons, not necessarily related to being able to be very flexible. And vocal learning, particularly in mammals, is actually not that common. Great apes and primates, apart from us, don't learn their vocalisations. You can't teach them sounds. What they produce is what they come with um, after they've been born. So you get a fairly straightforward set of vocalisations. 
the species that do learn, seals, cetaceans, whales and dolphins, bats, of all species, um, elephants, and then the rock hyrax, which I'll show you a picture of in a second. One of the most interesting, that's actually very little studied, but they're just starting to look at it now, is the seal. And seals are interesting because not only do they learn their vocalisations, but they also have a vocal apparatus that's relatively sophisticated and they can actually imitate human sounds. And I'm going to put, you might have heard this before, but this is Hoover, the seal, which was raised by a, I think it was a Canadian fisherman. And if you play the sound at the top, this is Hoover. Yeah. <laughs> So, hey, hey, come over here, pal. <laughs> so, obviously, the language that he learned wasn't very sophisticated, but he was copying both the accent and what his um, owner said. So, he was found as a, as a pup and then reared. <coughs> so, we've got about, I don't know, 90 species of cetaceans. There are several, well, 1,200 species of bats, about 30 or so species of seals, and then the elephants and hyrax that learn. But when it comes to birds, you get a, a huge number of species. Songbirds are our most recognisable garden birds, so all finches, sparrows, starlings, and across the planet there are about 4,000 species of songbirds, all of which learn their vocalisations. <coughs> Hummingbirds are kind of quite a separate group of birds, about um, 350 hummingbirds, different species, also learn their vocalisations. And there's about 350 species of parrots. Again, they learn their vocalisations. So across the bird world, you've got an incredibly wide variety of song learners and, and call learners. So the mammals where we see learning are those which seem to live in quite complicated social groups. It's a little puzzling still that the primates aren't in there. And what you find is you get repertoires. So they build up a whole library of different sounds that they use during that learning period. And that leads to the formation of dialects. So whales in different areas of the ocean have different songs. They learn them, pass them between each other. So you have got dialects. You can recognise who your locals are because they're singing the same songs. In the hyrax, they don't actually have that many different note types. But each group learns their note or puts their note types in a different order. So one might go A, B, B, C, D, E, and the other one goes E, 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 C, D, A. And that's their um, uh, dialect. And then there's also a huge variety of species where you have individual identity. So you can say, I'm here, I'm here. If you're a dolphin, you've got a whistle, and you make a particular whistle, and that indicates who you are. And they've also recently been shown to use other individuals' whistles to call them so they can kind of yell for somebody else, in effect, using their name. And all of these species, as I said, live in relatively complex social groups. The individual identity is an interesting one. This actually is the roar of a lion, and it's a sonogram. So it's time across the bottom, frequency here. If you play the sound. This is a very common type of um, vocalisation that seems to develop in animal groups where there are a reasonable number of individuals. And vowel sounds are really good at illustrating, if you like, the differences in your physical structure of your vocal tract. So we can easily tell the difference between individual speech and humans, even if you just hear somebody saying the letter A. And in mammals, that seems to work as well. So there's lots of species where individual identity is just that shape. Dolphins have taken it a step further, and many bird species have taken it a step further, and they produce completely different sounds <coughs> to indicate who they are. So there's been quite a bit of work on mammals, looking at their repertoires. But as far as I'm concerned, and it won't be a surprise that I work on birds, the bird song is much cooler. They learn so much more. You get birds that can learn songs through their whole life, and some of them will sing thousands, several thousand different note types that they can learn. They also get babbling, so exactly like we just saw in the baby, birds will produce all kinds of weird and wonderful sounds when they're very young, and because of social interaction, because of the feedback they get, they sort of narrow down until they're actually producing the right song for their area, for their species. 
But they also show the most amazing innovation. They can pick up sounds from anything, at least in some species. They can pick up car alarms, telephone, and um, parrots aren't the only ones that copy speech, as I'm sure you know. There's dialects, there's individual recognition, there's duetting, just like in the gibbons, and there's also some very complex social calls. So birds show almost everything that we've just seen in mammals and more. And, best of all, as we'll see at the end, they do dancing. So there are now a couple of species where there are coordinated singing and movements that are in effect dances. The next thing to know about birds is their vocal production mechanism is very different. We might have the best larynx amongst mammals, but birds have got a cyrix. And I don't know if you can see very well here, but there's two, um, sort of two channels coming up from the lungs leading into their trachea, and on either side of it are the vocal production organs. Um, organs. So they have two um, possibilities to produce a note. And if you click on this, it's actually a video, and you will see how a bird can sing with itself. Oh, sorry. Yep, okay. Yeah. So that's going down to the lungs, that's coming out the beak. I won't go into bird breathing, it's also completely different from mammals. You see it's coordinating left and right side of the music side of their syrinx to sing two notes at the same time um, and it's incredibly flexible and incredibly um, allows them to produce all those sounds that we can hear. The one thing that's been studied most in birds though is how they use their songs to um, attract a mate and to stop other males from stealing their mate or coming and taking their territory. So most of the work of bird song involves looking at what works for that. However, it's so different in different species that it's difficult to get commonality. I've got two recordings on this slide and the next slide that I recorded at the same time while I was out doing some field work. This is a skylark. This is about 20 seconds of his song that he sang for 20 minutes continuously while flying in the air. So if you can you know, play the sound. You can see this is these are the different note types. Um, again, it's time and frequency. Lots of different note types. Lots of different sounds that it produces, and it uses that to say, "Hey, come and mate with me. I'm awesome. Um, I've got lots of different note types." Um, and that seems to be quite common in birds. That the ones that sing the most elaborate songs are the ones that get um, the mate first. However, like I said, at the same time, I was recording a cell bunting. Perhaps we just play the top one in case we run out of time. That's his song. It's one note repeated. And they have between two and five song types. But each song type is one note just over and over again. And then they'll sing that for about 20 minutes. The same note type over and over again. But somehow that also works to say, hey, I'm a great male, come and mate with me, or don't come and mess with my territory. And that's what's so fascinating for me about bird song is that you've got the same function and it's um, sort of solved in lots and lots of different ways. And one of my favourite species is a little brown boring bird called banded wren. And in the bird literature, they're known as LBJs, little brown jobbies. And they are usually the ones with the most interesting vocal communication. It's as if everything that went into a peacock's tail comes out in their vocalisations. So, play the sound. So it doesn't sound super, super exciting, but it does to another banded wren. <laughs> Long songs, different songs. But it's how they actually use it in an interaction. So each male again sings different note types. 
So I was trying to work out where do you think the threshold is? Where does land, where do you start thinking this is a complex reassortment of, of a repertoire which is making reference to its environment and is socially and environmentally contextualised? When does it stop being that? When does it start actually being a language? It will start with, with Lawrence on that, and then we'll okay. go to Sarah. A quick Lawrence, just... Uh, yes, uh, okay. <laughs> Um, yes, uh, I think that was quite the definition that you gave there, actually. Um, so, okay, okay. Uh, I can hear myself better that way. Um, yes, so, when did it become a language? I think there are two, there are several critical points about language. One of them is this ability to express a sort of infinite range of meaning. So we can say, as I said at the start, we can say things that people have never said before, and they will be understood. Um, and most, um, most uh, creatures, when they're making reference to the environment, there's a fairly fixed range of points of reference. The other thing um, that I'd like to say about language is it, it's the really striking thing about human language is the fact that it's a moving target. It's constantly changing. So people, um, older people, always moan about, oh, the youth of today and all their slang. I heard someone on the radio last night complaining about street slang in South London, and how it's not proper language. But that's the way it always goes. Language always changes. And the particularly young people will come up with their new forms of language and um, new forms of expression. I think, uh, uh, critically, to distinguish themselves, to mark out their social group, uh, as distinct from other social groups. And I know, I, I don't know the extent to which birds do that, but that's certainly not something that happens in other primates. Uh, who would you say that? Yes, birds do everything. Um, so you get cultural evolution in birds, you get birds in different regions developing completely different systems, and you get thousands of notes that are used in lots of different ways. And I think the, the fundamental thing is in a bird, its repertoire is almost like a linear thing. The more you've got of it, the more attractive you are. It's not that you're saying more, it's you're just showing off how versatile you are. So it's actually used in a different way. They're not, the repertoires aren't referring to things, they are showing off how good your memory is, how many things you can do with your vocalisation. And those referential signals are just very simple, straightforward, selected to allow the right predator avoidance. It's not use truly symbolic with a truly kind of underlying meaning that the animals recognise they are simply responding to most of the evidence. So I'd say birds do similar things to language but it isn't the same underlying principle about syntax and vocabulary. Yeah, I think that's very clever both of you. Thank you very much. Let's have one, a few more questions. Yes. Yes, yes. What a question over here. Excellent. I assume um, what Sarah said, the birds you need to get to me. Okay, yeah, so, so the birds are communicating, but it's been quite clear, it's not language. They do think this is going to be about language for its development. Because we do all sorts of things, people go out, they dress in certain ways, they walk in certain ways, which is different what your birds do. They do it to a place. That's not language. That is non verbal communication. And neither of us say anything about you and your answers, you're the best answer. Perhaps, both of you want to comment on that. Sarah first, maybe? I think you're talking about the neurolinguistics, then in birds, the, the neurology of underlying sound production is very well understood. Yeah. And people have obviously tried to relate it to language. I don't think it does relate to language. I think it's a different system and it's allowed for complex, well, complex repertoires, but it's not language. Um, it is about impressing. And I think. Um, I think animal communication is interesting in its own right, and I'm you know, not really going to say much more about the neurolinguistics as I go and do uh, playback experiments. I'm not sure about neurolinguistics myself, really. Um, <laughs> Yes, uh, but with regard to sexual selection, I think there's an argument to be made that actually one of the pressures on us developing language initially, this, this range of communication may be very similar actually to, to birds in just being able to show off our linguistic versati versatility. And there's, there's a school of thought that the primary selection for this, this creative power of language was actually sexual selection. I heard someone once use the phrase survival of the glimmers. Um, but anyway, well, that's a fascinating one. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've got time for one more question. Yes, we've got a question over here. Do you have a thing inside your head that you want to say to the 
Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll just bring you the mic. Yes. Um, do you ever think like birds, reptiles are ever going to evolve into a language or is it just going to be predominantly human? Excellent um, question. Yes, that's skill, Sarah. It's an interesting question. I think at the moment the species that are under study when they use the ones that have several thousand um, known types don't seem to use them like language. But um, if I had time, I would say that you might know that Corvid species, crows and jays, are often used in experiments to show mental abilities. And they've shown similar ones to great apes in terms of solving puzzles and theory of mind and so on. They also have very complex communication, but it's often at the level of individuals very close to each other in their social groups, and it's really hard to jam a microphone between them. Whereas if you're recording a skylock, if you're doing things up in the air, you can go out, you can record it, you can do a playback, you can ask questions by doing that. Some species where that complicated language potential may be is, is more difficult to study, and whether it's still changing, I don't know, but it would be nice to, nice to observe. Just to add to that, yes, I mean, obviously Sarah is the expert on birds, but uh, I was going to mention, yeah, corvid species like crows seem to be incredibly intelligent and have, have, have problem-solving powers which are really over and above those that you would see in, in most primates. There's some great footage on YouTube of a crow, for instance, fashioning a little hook from a piece of wire to, to get some food out, out of the tube. Just amazing sort of inventiveness and straight, straight on the fly, no sort of trial and error there. So I think it's certainly, um, there's no reason to think that evolution has stopped. And um, you know, we managed to evolve language, we've evolved the vocal capabilities and brain power. The birds certainly have vocal capabilities for language. There's no reason why they shouldn't carry on evolving. Yeah, no, I mean, there are 4,000 songbird species and probably, I don't know, 10, 15 of them have been well studied. So there's a lot that we just don't know what's going on. Well, there, that we have it. What will happen in the future? Will we actually have Dr. Doolittle speaking to animals who have it on the power of speech and power of power? Watch this space, come back in a thousand years' time. <laughs> Perhaps more. Well, I think it's time for us now to have our, our vote again. Um, I need to change sides. Can we change sides? So, uh, so left and right will be slightly different. But now on your left, it's Sarah. Sarah's taking the view. And we've actually come to much more consensus, I think. The problem is there's probably more consensus than I I'm trying to put out in the beginning. I agree with Sarah. Uh, <laughs> Sarah agrees with you. Um, so let's, let's just see, who thinks, just as a very simple, do animals have language, yes or no? Right? Really simple. Who thinks animals have language? Raise your hands now. And who thinks that they haven't? Yay. Well, <laughs> we've actually got about the same, but there's been a shift. And I think that although, um, you know, there's an equal balance, I think Lawrence has actually won the argument this time. And that he has, so congratulations, Lawrence, and congratulations to Sarah. Thank you very much, audience. Thank you.